Weather is what makes the most dangerous sport possible. But the weather can play tricks on unwary sportsmen. The ultimate in thrill-seeking and adventure are only possible when you tackle the weather head-off. If we're climbing up with a good lenticular and it looks like we can go to 25, 30,000 feet, we should go probably 8,000 feet on yeah. the first. But Spreckley may be headed for a disaster. Gliders have no engines. Once aloft, he will be at the mercy of the wind. He's going to attempt to set a new record for high altitude gliding in the Pyrenees. His goal is to reach 30,000 feet. To succeed, he'll need to find what is called wave lift. Wave lift is generated by the wind coming along and striking a mountain or an object. And as it comes and hits the mountain, it comes up over, down the backside of the mountain and compresses. It goes down and down until the ground gets in the way. It then must come back up again. And as it uncompresses and it starts to come up, there's nothing to stop it. It keeps going up and up and up and up and up. And it can go four, five, six times the height of the mountain. But of course, if you have two or three mountains, one after the other, it can be accelerated. So by the last mountain, the, way, the air really travels up very fast indeed, ten times maybe the height of the mountain. For today's record-breaking attempt, Spreckley takes a co-pilot as a safety measure. The tug plane tows the glider toward the wave lift over the mountains. Spreckley searches for a sign to indicate that a wave is occurring. The sign is lenticular clouds. To see if there's good wave lift, we look up above the mountains, and if we can see lenticular clouds, which are saucer-shaped clouds, which shows us what the air is doing. Normally the air is invisible. With the cloud shape, we can see the movement of the air. And we're looking for that, and if we have a stack of these, like saucers, stuck one on top of the other, then we have beautiful wave conditions. At 7,000 feet, the glider releases the tow line and freshly turns into the mountain. When a glider catches a wave, the ride is silky smooth. But the air just outside the wave can be very turbulent. The glider hits the rough air. Spreckley knows if he flies through it, he'll find the wave. Avoid the downdraft on the far side of the mountain. 
and the violent winds there to smash the glider against the mountainside. Presley finds the wave and his glider starts to climb. The air is glassy smooth. The altimeter shows they are rising at a thousand feet a minute. As they reach 12,000 feet, Wesley and his co-pilot put on their oxygen masks. At this height, the air is very thin. Now it's a race against time. They only have one hour's worth of oxygen and they're still climbing. The wave takes the pilot even higher. Wesley has set a new record. They're flying as high as a commercial airliner, but they're not in a pressurized cabin. Outside, the air temperature is minus 35 degrees. With just the plastic of the canopy separating the pilots from the extreme cold, Wesley decides that it's time to come down. If they stay up any longer, the canopy will completely ice over, sealing the pilots inside with only their instruments to guide them. Presley finds the weakest part of the wave and begins his descent. knowledge of weather conditions, this kind of flying would be impossible. The power which enables us to fly is the weather. It's the sun, the wind, and all of the elements of the weather. If you don't understand what they're doing, you can't be a glider pilot. If you can't read the sky, see the story the clouds are telling you, understand what the sun is doing to the air, you can't be a good glider pilot. You must understand this motor, this engine that drives it along, which allows us to go gliding. Just before landing, they loop the loop to celebrate their achievement. When there are no 
thermals, the pilot may turn to another form of lift, ridge lift. It's produced when air hits a cliff face or mountain and is deflected up. This kind of lift allows the pilot to fly almost indefinitely back and forth along the ridge. They must be sensitive to the tiniest changes. Of all extreme sports that take on the weather, mountaineering is the most dangerous. The north face of the Eiger has a fearsome reputation. The weather can change suddenly. The Eiger is known for its ferocious blizzards and almost constant ice and rock falls. Between 1935 and 1938, in early attempts to conquer it, 10 people died. Deaths became so frequent that the Swiss Parliament passed a law banning mountaineers from the North Face. It cools and the water vapor condenses to form clouds, which increase the amount of snow and rain. The rising air is squeezed by the upper atmosphere, increasing the wind speed over the summit, and slowing it down on the sheltered side. all sorts of local effects which can lead to sudden dramatic changes in the weather. Mountaineers have to be prepared for the worst. The Eiger has lured many of the world's greatest climbers to their death. summer of 1936, a team of four Austrians started their attempt on the north face on a beautiful, clear July evening. They had waited weeks for perfect weather. At first, everything went according to plan, and by the next morning, they had successfully traversed across a sheer wall. With the weather on their side, and with no thought of turning back, they pulled the rope after them. It was a decision they would live to regret. Retreat across the wall would be impossible. After their second night on the mountain, they were halfway up the north face. Then suddenly, as they scaled the second ice field, tragedy struck. One of their party had a severe head wound, and they were forced to retreat. The weather started to deteriorate. Unable to retrace their steps, their only choice was to attempt a direct descent. The men had been on the mountain four days, and were now soaked to the skin and beginning to freeze. Time was running out. In the valley below, it was raining torrentially. On the mountain face, a blizzard raged. Soon, only one climber remained alive. One had been trapped against the rocks where he froze. Another fell to his death. The climber who had been injured slipped on ice and was strangled by his rope. Tony Kirk, the remaining climber, had to detach himself from his dead friend to gain enough rope. When this was not enough, he painfully unraveled the strands of the rope, knotting them into one longer rope, a process that took him four hours. With his 
left arm completely useless from frostbite, Chris began to descend. Then, within yards of his would-be rescuers, he got stuck. A knot in the rope would not pass through his carabiner. Five minutes later, he was dead from exhaustion. It was so cold that eight-inch icicles had formed on his crampons. The eiger remained unconquered. Some adventurers have climbed higher than the tallest mountains. In 1991, a team of British and Australian explorers wanted to use hot air balloons to conquer one of the most difficult weather systems in the world, the shifting winds over Mount Everest. Everest is the highest mountain in the world, soaring to 29,028 feet. To clear the summit and survive, the balloonists would have to rise to over 34,000 feet. The expedition leader had calculated that this height would allow them to avoid the dangerous turbulence on the far side of the peak. It's very important when you've got something like Everest in your way that you don't just clear it to avoid hitting it, but you clear it to avoid what is known as a curlover effect coming over the top. And the wind that goes over the top of Everest would hit the top and be dragged and roll over the other side, creating a kind of vortex on the other side. And it's terribly important, particularly in a balloon, that you don't get dragged down into this vortex onto the other side. To give themselves the best possible chance of success, the team built the world's most remote weather station at the foot of Everest. Satellite imagery, radar, and weather balloons helped the team decide when to launch. It was vital to know air temperatures at different altitudes, wind speeds, and if there was the slightest chance of a storm breaking. At 7 a.m. on a November morning, they took off. Hot air balloons work on the principle that hot air rises. As long as the air inside the balloon stays hotter than the air outside, they would be able to float over the sun. They climbed at a thousand feet a minute until finally they hit the jet stream. The temperature was minus 70 degrees. The jet stream successfully carried the balloons over the summit at 60 miles per hour. They had just a wicker basket between them and the ground far below. began the descent, problems occurred. One of the balloons began to run out of fuel. It descended at over 2,000 feet a minute and started to spin dangerously. Hot air balloons are not very aerodynamic, and it looked as if the expedition would end in disaster. But there was just enough fuel left for the pilot to regain control before landing. The balloons touched down on Tibetan soil just one hour after takeoff. The team had become the first to fly over Everest by hot air balloon. The French Alps serve up some of the most ferocious weather on the planet. Anyone wanting to survive these mountains will have to face the dangers of ice, wind, and sudden avalanches. Tardivelle is a weather expert. He has to be. He's one of a tiny elite of extreme skiers who can ski down 60 degree slopes. He doesn't ski down any mountain without first climbing all the way to the top. As he climbs, he checks for any hidden danger. Many of his friends and competitors have fallen to their deaths. Tardivelle stays alive by exercising maximum caution. In 
in a sport where just one mistake can end in death, Cartavel is a superb skier, a first-rate mountaineer, and he always waits for the best possible weather conditions. The weather is very important because we cannot ski with bad snow. It will be very dangerous. Imagine uh, in a south face, if uh, you have too much sun, the snow will become very fastly dangerous and you may have huge avalanches. So you must choose exactly the good moment where the snow is just a little bit melted by the sun, but not too much. If, if, if it is too icy, you cannot ski. You will just slip and fall. Cardavel is attempting to ski down Mount Oreb, a descent of more than 7,000 feet, all of it high-risk skiing. If he makes it, he will be the first. slowly in the slope and it was not so bad but uh, I was always very nervous. Thirty minutes after snapping on his ski, Cardavel adds Mount Ore to his list of firsts. Other extreme skiers will have to take even greater risks with the weather if they want to beat Cardavel. People will always stretch themselves to the limit of human endurance. In the world of extreme sports, where every twist and turn is fraught with danger, the weather provides the ultimate challenge. Next, we found a half monkey, half man who lived in the trees. Visit the site in South Africa, next on Paleo World. Them Zulu warriors shake their spears, rallying under Shaka Zulu on real history, right here on TLC.